Sicily? Well, this quote, I think, goes to the heart of it. You matter because you are you, and you matter to the last moment of your life. We will do all we can, not only to help you to die peacefully, but also live until you die. Cicely certainly has been an inspiration, I think, to everybody who's gone into palliative care. Absolutely everybody. And I think her impact has got greater with time, actually. It's been, it's even more now than it was in the days when she was alive. So I want to talk about end-of-life care and laws generally. Now, just overall, laws are more than regulatory instruments. They send social messages. For example, seatbelts, banning smoking in public places. Some of us are trying very hard to get the drink driving limit down much lower, uh, from 80 to 50, if not to 20, if not to 10. I think it should go right down. It would give a clear social message, but the government don't want to pick it up yet. But there are lots of examples of social messages, but also legislation can have unintended consequences. And I'm going to focus a bit on that. So if you're going to legislate, you have to be very clear that legislation is now needed. And I'm going to talk about my own access to palliative care bill, a little bit on the Mental Capacity Act, because I now have been tasked with chairing the National Mental Capacity Forum for the Ministry of Justice, and then go on to the evidence from legislation around the world around so-called assisted dying. So my bill. Well, I introduced my bill because having sat and watched things happen, I felt the time has come that England really does need legislation to iron out some of the bumps in provision. You could say we don't need a legislation in the UK because we came top on the quality of death index. We were ranked number one by the latest um, uh, Lien Foundation funded uh, e Economist Intelligence Unit report. But we have had reports galore on problems with the quality. Now, the Health and Social Care Act, I do think, was a pivotal moment, and I do think it has had unintended consequences. And just to encapsulate them, Julie Moore said, they, the reorganisation cut it from 118 crown goes to 234 and reduced the level of bureaucracy above me from three to 24. And I think that encapsulates some of the problems. And the clinical commissioning groups are now responsible for commissioning. So I wanted to know what was happening and sent a freedom of information request to all 209 clinical commissioning groups. We wanted to know if they had services that would intervene when people are in crisis. Because if you don't have a service there, then you can't go and find one because the crisis is there and now and people can't wait. And this is, many of you will be familiar with the Peacock model, where you can say really that there are some broad categories, but if you wait until the end one, the dying one, then you're too late, you've missed the boat, because you need to be there when the crises happen. Because at the crises, people can either get driven further into despair, as Robert's just described with his father briefly, or you can actually take people out of that crisis into living again well. But that is hard work and it requires skills. Is there evidence that palliative care enhances the quality of life? Well, you're all familiar, I'm sure, with the Temel study. And the most astounding thing there was, I think, the extended survival time. That people actually lived longer when they were getting high quality palliative care intervention early. That kind of makes sense intuitively. And I'm grateful to Irene for her graph that she sent me from her study that's already been referred to again showing significant benefit and importantly no difference in cost. So helping people live better for longer doesn't cost more. The Ombudsman report came out last year and made salutary reading. It was based on complaints to the Ombudsman and it is chilling. If anyone hasn't read it, I suggest that you do. And highlighted these six areas that require addressing. Recognising people are dying, poor symptom control, poor pain control. Goodness me, isn't that a terrible indictment? So many years after Cicely and Robert Wyckoff, 
who I think is here in the room, and Jeff Fanks, who sadly has died, uh, actually taught us how to prescribe morphine. Really simple. Poor communication and so on. Poor care planning. And following that, the House of Commons Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee looked at the report, and this is just one quote from their report on the Ombudsman's report, which was that staff now no longer appear to feel confident in looking after people who are dying, and obviously that is a significant training issue. That has implications for every undergraduate programme in healthcare and in social care, and all the MVQs, the care assistants, everybody. This isn't just about medical schools and schools of nursing. Because actually, if we don't improve care across the board, we will leave our patients betrayed by bad care. And the Health Select Committee last year also ran an inquiry. And in the, um, their recommendations, I've pulled out their one about access. And they have recommended round-the-clock access to specialist palliative care that it would greatly improve the way that people uh, are, are treated and would address the variation in quality. And they comment on the value of specialist outreach services. Now this is years on from when Cicely started. We all know what to do, but we're just not doing it. The Choices Review came out over a year ago saying what people want at the end of life. But the government, oops, sorry, the government still hasn't reported on that. Their response isn't out yet. And all of these different documents, and there were more as well, have all fed into the ambitions document, and some of you in the room were involved in producing that, which sets out really great ambitions. We know what to do, but we've got to make it happen. So let me go back to that freedom of information request. When we asked, we found that only 22 knew the number of people that they were commissioning services for that had palliative care needs. And their estimate came out at around, the median was 0.32%, which is much lower than the literature reviews uh, that would suggest that it should be somewhere around about 0.75% of a population. You would have some variation, but I was really surprised that so many of them didn't even know how many people had needs. And when we looked at their commissioning of specialist palliative care services, it was pretty variable. Uh, some are commissioning really well, a lot of services, and others almost nothing. But what worried me were the ones where we didn't even have data. That was even more worrying than the ones that we had data from. We've just had the report come out from the College of Physicians about specialist palliative care in hospitals in England. And what does that show? Face-to-face -face specialist palliative care in 18% of trusts has at no time any medical input. 37% of sites, that's just over a third, have face-to-face -face services on seven days a week. Two-thirds don't. And only 11% of trusts can have somebody appear on a 24-7 basis. Most could access telephone advice. That's hardly surprising, I would hope, because they probably have got a hospice in their area they can phone. And most have got a staff education programme of some sort. And some of you may have seen the, the news at the weekend. There have been questions about how many people have DNA CPR discussions documented in the notes but actually the number I think it was 94 percent or 93 percent of discussions had involved the family that the person was dying so things have got better discussions about somebody dying have got better and I don't want to put too much weight on a DNA CPR particularly because it's been misreported as DNA R and we are only talking about CPR we are only talking about thump and shock when somebody's already arrested. But we have these strategies to guide provision in England. And we have strategies that cover cancer, dementia, diabetes, mental health, learning disabilities, maternity care, 
but where is the ubiquitous experience of dying? It's not there. And it isn't just cancer patients that die. Everybody will die. All of these patients will die. I hope not in maternity care, but there will be stillbirths and tragically there will be occasional maternity deaths. But it's how people are managed before they die. If the services aren't there, you can't do what people need. Now, in parallel, back in Wales, in 2008, we had a palliative care strategy. The difference was that we didn't have the Health and Social Care Act. So we actually have a uniformity. For whatever criticisms people may level at healthcare in Wales, working in palliative care, it has been brilliant. <coughs> Because we've been able to say, right, we need to make sure that wherever you are, whether you are in Snowdonia on that lovely mountain, down on the beach in Pembrokeshire, in Cardiff in a lovely old Victorian building or in a little terrace in the valleys where you might have 40% unemployment, you have to be able to access specialist help if there's a crisis and those looking after you can't manage. And it has to be seven days a week. And we have to have advice available on a 24-7 basis. So our strategy was to do that. And people say, oh, you wouldn't be able to, and there have been problems. There haven't been problems at all. We have been able to roll that out. I'm not saying we're perfect. I'm not claiming that we're doing anything better than other people. But we do at least have a template that provides services everywhere, seven days a week with advice 24-7 with public engagement and national standards agreed everywhere in policies. So after all those reports saying things weren't that good, I thought really something has to happen and hence my access to palliative care bill. And that places a duty on commissioners to commission specialist palliative care services seven days a week to make sure there's a point of contact, that medication is available, equipment's available, people get information, there is telephone advice, there's support to teams, that research is there, that CQC carries on benchmarking, and that people can be admitted to palliative care beds seven days a week. How terrible on a Saturday morning to be told, oh, we'll see about the admission next Monday, after we've had the team meeting. If somebody needs in, they need in. I would have to say in all the years that I worked in palliative care and when I was medical director of the Marie Curie Centre in particular, I would accept people at all times of the day and night, even if we apparently didn't seem to have a bed. I've only once had a patient who had to sit on a chair and wait for the bed to be made up. And that was only for an hour and a bit. She had a cup of tea, <laughs> she was fine. Um, but, you know, when people are in crisis, they need in. And all of these barriers, rationing, don't work. They leave people in crisis and they make the crisis work. So I think we have to recognise that specialist palliative care is an emergency service. It is not uh, like going in for a hip replacement. It is not an elective service. And it has to be available when the crisis arises. So what happened with my bill? Well, I've got it right through the House of Lords. I've sent it to the Commons. Unfortunately, we prorogue on Thursday. So my bill will fall. Um, I've already said I'm going to try and introduce it again. I'm putting it in the ballot again. Um, and in the meantime, I've been doing a lot of discussion behind the scenes with the government. They still don't want to support it because they don't want to single out <coughs> one so-called disease group for treatment <coughs> which is different from the rest. But I think you can see from that strategy, we've already got six groups singled out, including the dementia challenge from the Prime Minister, maternity services that have just been reviewed. So it really is time, it is time for palliative care to be a right for every patient when they're in crisis to be able to access specialist care if those looking after them can't manage and cope. But let me move on to another piece of legislation, the Mental Capacity Act. Unlike the uh, Health and Social Care Act, it's been generally welcomed as an excellent piece of legislation. But even that has had some unintended consequences. 
which are now a burden for me in trying to sort out. So everybody else, raise your dominant hand, please. And just think, your pinky, presumed to have capacity. Your ring finger, being supported to make their own decisions. And your middle finger, unwise decisions. Don't assume someone has capacity. They can make unwise decisions. Indeed, we have all made unwise decisions. Some extremely unwise. The most unwise decision I have heard anyone admit to was somebody who tried to find the source of a gas leak by lighting a match. <laughs> the problem was <laughs> that uh, a few years later, when she thought there was another gas leak, she did exactly the same thing. Mm, there we go. You can put your hands down now, because the next thing I want you to think about, that, that's all about you, isn't it? That's about me, that's about people normally. You have capacity, you want people to speak so you can hear them, you want to give literature in a language you can understand and speech in a language you can understand and help you make decisions with the accurate information appropriate to you. But what about when you lack capacity? That's your index finger and your thumb. That is the most powerful movement in your hand. That is where the power of health and social care professionals rests. It is taking best interest decisions when you have to and using the least restrictive option which requires liberty and security. This isn't just about freedom to go off and do whatever you want because it may be that people need security as well and that needs to be balanced in the equation. So I hope you feel, the lady there, that that was fair on the five principles of the Mental Capacity Act. Yes, good, she's nodding fortunately, not shaking her head. But what are the unintended consequences? Well, one of the problems with best interest decisions is that because warring families are alive and well and living across Britain, uh, the decision was made, and rightly so, uh, that the final decision rests with the doctor, the consultant, over a best interest decision. Or it might be with the social worker. But that can mean that carers and families feel very excluded, very cut out and don't understand why, particularly those coming from different cultures. Confidentiality, I fear, has been used as a barrier now to communication. So people will hide behind confidentiality rather than share what's going on. And assessments, I'm afraid, seem to take a priority over sitting down and listening. Too many bits of paper, not enough sitting down and listening. And the deprivation of liberty safeguards and post Cheshire West have resulted in a phenomenal bureaucracy. And I cannot find anyone, anyone at all, who can show me the cost efficacy of the processes. Thousands and thousands of people being signed off as deprivation of liberty, thousands of families distressed by their dead relative being referred to the coroner and having, feeling tainted as if there's a criminality. There are unintended consequences and we've got to do something about it, so we're going to have to pass legislation to rectify that. And advanced decisions to refuse treatment, I think, are sometimes misunderstood. But the group that worries me most, where confidentiality is used as a barrier to having open conversations with families, are children in families. Because we know, as Cicely said, the way a person dies lives on in the memory of those left behind. We know from the data that we got in Wales because we looked across Wales that in every school class of 30 or so pupils, on average, there is one bereaved of a parent or sibling and two bereaved of someone significant to them. 10% of our young people at school age are bereaved. They are silent, bereaved, not supported, not helped. The child bereavement charities are really trying to do a fantastic job, but it is literally the tip of the iceberg that they see. And these are, the, these are drawings, two drawings from children, just to illustrate. They have the same feelings and sadness but they don't have the vocabulary to express it. They don't understand why this has happened to them. And when they go to school, they get bullied, they feel left out. No wonder they're at higher risk of depression, suicide, underperforming academically, and so on. 
So actually something that should have improved our communication with all age groups, I don't think has made a scrap of difference. And I think that in a way that's an unintended consequence. Because when that act was going through, I really had great hopes that we would have more open conversations with families about preparing their children and in saying every time there's somebody who's ill in front of you, is there a child being affected by this? And if so, have things been explained? So perhaps the only thing I want you to remember from this talk is somebody's dying, think child. It might be a grandparent, it might be an aunt or uncle, but they might be the most significant person in that child's life. But what about the moves now? I'm going to move on to other bits of legislation, one that's been resisted in the UK to date, <laughs> which is around so-called assisted dying. And again, I would stress that laws send social messages and can have unintended consequences. And I'm going to take you through just a few questions now, because if you're talking about life ending as opposed to end of life care, you have to say, what's the law now? And do we need a change? And if so, what we put in its place, would that be better than what we've got already? Because if it wouldn't be, then don't legislate. What about the law in England and Wales? Well, suicide is not illegal, but encouraging or assisting another person's suicide is. Refusing treatment is not illegal, but acting with the intention of bringing about a patient's death is illegal. There is a right to die. You can refuse treatment. And actually, we're all going to die anyway. But what we're talking about is do you change the law to license doctors to be able to supply lethal drugs against a set of criteria to people at their request? At the moment, any case brought has to go to the Director of Public Prosecutions. And there are two tests one of evidence, and the other one is, is it in the public interest? And the compassionate interpretation by the DPP of that small number of cases, around 20 a year that have gone to Switzerland, or have had assisted suicide here, <coughs> has been no. Nothing would be gained in the public interest by bringing a prosecution. So that's the situation that we have at the moment. But let me run through assisted dying legislation in action. Physician-assisted suicide is what they have in Oregon. You either have to take lots of tablets or you have it in solution, but it's usually about a tumbler full, about that much. It's not a small quantity. Euthanasia is where the doctor in, uh, injects to bring about death as fast as possible. And I'm going to look at the two acts, Oregon's Death with Dignity Act and the Netherlands' Termination of Life on Request and Assisted Suicide Act. So what's involved? Well, I said the patient self-administers in physician-assisted suicide a massive dose of barbiturates. People tried other things and people didn't die uh, efficiently enough. So you preload with an antiemetic and then you take a large dose of barbiturates, usually somewhere around about 9 or 10 grams. For euthanasia, you inject a short-acting anaesthetic agent. You may follow that up with pancuronium to completely paralyse somebody Anyone who's done anaesthetics knows that's total paralysis. Nothing moves. Person dies of asphyxia. Even if they regain consciousness, they would have no movement. You would not know. But they die of asphyxia, basically. This is not sedation at the end of life, as we do it in the UK. It's not terminal sedation. The Dutch protocol which is very clearly laid out and the Dutch are very straightforward and very honest about the way that they use drugs and what they do. They start off with what I would term a massive dose of midazolam, plus or minus barbiturate. There is no dose titration and they aim to keep the person in coma until death. That is quite different to our aim, which is to keep symptom control while somebody's dying, usually starting with pretty low doses converting oral to subcutaneous, and what I would term sometimes a little tick of midazolam for someone who's anxious, but not the big dose. And it's not like taking the dog to the vet. There are complications. They've been written up in two papers, which I, uh, 
uh, which uh, there's the uh, paper from Holland, which is now quite old from the New England Journal of Medicine. And then I've looked at the Oregon's own reports, and they've had six people over the years that have woken up again. And the time uh, to death has been up to 104 hours. Uh, some patients have vomited. The time to induce coma tends to not be that long, but the time to death can be very long. And it must be very strange to wake up again. So what does their Oregon's law says? Well, you have to be adult. You have to be defined as having a terminal illness with a prognosis of less than six months. You have to be capable, acting voluntarily, and have made an informed decision. They require two doctors. doesn't say what type, any two. And there's a 15-day waiting period, a cooling-off period from the request and 48 hours from when you submit your written request to when you can actually receive your lethal prescription. And there is a requirement that if in doubt about the mental state of the person, they should be referred for psychiatric or psychological assessment. The one I want to focus on, though, is this key about <coughs> capable, voluntary and an informed decision. Because after all, that's what we require for every decision that you take. Every decision in healthcare, actually every decision in life, whether it's even to buy a car, a washing machine or a house, or certainly whether it's to get married. In, in our law, it should be a voluntary decision, not with a gun to your head. So what about the information for an informed decision? Well, the House of Lords Select Committee, um, which I was privileged to be sitting on, heard from the pathologist that actually at post-mortem 5% of diagnoses are not what was written on the death certificate. And there is evidence that prognosis is just a probabilistic R. It's a best guess. And there's been a good integrative literature review that even when somebody's at the end stage of life, you really can't accurately diagnose dying. So you have to assume that, they, that they're dying and work towards it, but keep on looking for reversible causes. So what does the data from Oregon tell us about prognosis and diagnosis? Prognosis, well, the time from the first application to physician-assisted suicide had a median of 45 days, but actually the range was 15 to over 1,000 days. That's way beyond six months. What about the relationship between the doctor and the patient? Some in the latest report were as short as one week. In last year's report, the preceding one, it was actually less than a week. It was recorded as zero sometimes. Um, but it can be a long relationship where somebody knows them. And the diagnostic categories, well, the one that worries me a bit is the 10%, because it includes um, diseases under other, but in that it lists benign tumours, diabetes, connective tissue disorders, things which I don't think we would normally consider to really come into the category of being terminally ill. Um, MS is in there. It can be advanced MS. It's difficult to know where that one fits in. What about mental capacity? Well, capacity to make a decision looks simple when it's written down, but actually we know that about a third of patients with neurological disease are cognitively impaired. And in Oregon, there's evidence from a very good study by Linda Ganzini that was published in the BMJ, where she followed 18 patients prospectively, that one in six of them had a clinical depression. It wasn't depression sadness, it was categorized as clinical. And those three patients were all in the group of nine who took the lethal drugs. And her comment, I put at the bottom there, her concern that the current practice may not adequately protect all mentally ill patients. So what drives a desire for death? Well, we know that feeling a burden does. There's a particularly correlation with psychological problems and existential issues. Depression and hopelessness are mutually reinforcing independent predictors of a desire for death. And of course, not surprisingly, major depression as well. But what about voluntariness? That's the really difficult one. The internal pressures or the external pressures, the fluctuating desire for death that we all see in patients. 
and compassion. Well, I wish all families were loving families, but I'm afraid the evidence is that they're not. And I've been horrified now that I'm working with the Office of the Public Guardian to see how many families are actually not loving families at all. But fraud and coercion seem to be far worse than I had ever thought. And we know about elder abuse in society as well and the data on that. But what about the influence of the doctor's attitude? The doctor who's hopeless, who doesn't like the patient, who perhaps has got other things on their mind. The patient picks up all those non-verbal cues. And what about normalisation in society? Does this become an expected behaviour? So what does the data from Oregon show us? From, well, from their own um, reports, these are from the Oregon Health Department, they show in the, in the last two years an 80% increase in the number of assisted suicides and a huge rise, that's the blue bars, in the number of patients given a prescription for lethal drugs. Now that has gone up so much that it would be astonishing if next year the death rate wasn't even higher. So this is a steady rate, a steady climb, hasn't plateaued out. And doctors in Oregon? Well, Linda Ganzini has, in a, um, a chapter she's written in, in a book on palliative care and ethics, has pointed out that two thirds of doctors won't participate. And therefore, because of that, there is actually doctor shopping. There's a short duration of relationship that fits with doctor shopping. We have no idea how the assessments of people for eligibility are done. And the number of prescriptions written by doctors who are prescribing lethal drugs range from 1 to 27 per doctor. 27 seems an awful lot of lethal prescriptions for one doctor be right to be writing to me. But and Oregon's Compassion and Choices, who are their campaign group, told the House of Lords that they view themselves as guardians of the law. And in evidence to the Faulkner Commissioner, a volunteer from there said and described having to find a prescribing physician and the person, the client, then had to see this prescribing physician. So what they're doing is people will contact them. If a doctor won't prescribe, they will find a doctor who will prescribe for them. Barbara Wagner's story, I think, is also instructive just simply because of the financial pressures in health that we're all aware of, where she was prescribed palliative chemotherapy for a lung cancer, but actually she got notification from Oregon's health plan that the chemotherapy wasn't covered, but assisted suicide drugs were 100% covered as a comfort measure. And in Oregon, there isn't scrutiny of the quality of the assessment itself, as I said. There isn't post-event scrutiny, and there is no monitoring of unused drugs. There's no way of knowing what happens to drugs that aren't taken. And the data depends on the reporting doctor to, to put it in. What about the Netherlands? Well, in the Netherlands, there isn't a requirement for terminal illness or mental capacity. Their act is very honest. It states what it is. It's a termination of life on request and assisted suicide. They require a request to be voluntary and well considered. That means that mental capacity has to be present. Suffering has to be unbearable with no prospect of improvement. Their age limit is lower, 12 to 16 with parental consent and 16 or over otherwise and the second independent doctor is trained in assessment is a scan doctor and is properly trained and i've had the privilege of being involved in teaching palliative care to quite a few of these doctors so what does the netherlands data show us well the netherlands data has also been going up so that now the rate is about threefold what it was when they changed their law they thought that the law that there wasn't going to be a rise. They thought that they'd plateaued at even the time that they changed their laws. There has been a change in the profile of illnesses there. There has been an increase in patients with psychiatric disorders, depression and dementia. Uh, the scrutiny, there is scrutiny. There's post-event reporting by five regional committees, but they do have a backlog in their assessment and almost all of the cases are, report, uh, are cleared as being within the law. Else Borse was the person who introduced their legislation, and she is quoted as having said she felt they got it the wrong way around, they should have improved their palliative care first. And I heard that in the Netherlands quite often from doctors there. 
who are trying very hard to improve their palliative care. But the quote that I, w I want to bring to your attention is Theo Ball, because he had previously supported the, the change in the law, but he now says, we were wrong, terribly wrong. In hindsight, the stabilisation in numbers was just a temporary <coughs> pause. Beginning in 2008, the numbers of these deaths show a 15% increase annually, year on year. And he's an ethicist who's been on one of the regional committees and supported the change in the law initially. Belgium also changed their law. It's interesting to see their change and their rise because it's happened mostly in Flanders. I can't get the data at the moment for Flanders and Wallonia for the last two years, but I've only been able to access the total so far. But there's no reason to think that that will change. So what's the current law here? Well, as I said, we don't have a law on assisted dying. The principle of our law is to deter people from assisting suicide. There is prosecutorial discretion and it reflects our suicide prevention policies with a clear line. And I think it sends a social message that you matter because you are you. And the proposals of the practice, well, safeguards aren't verifiable, I'm afraid. I, don't, I haven't seen evidence that they are. The proposal of a court agreement was simply a signing off measure and the problem is codes of practice were not presented to Parliament so Parliament was being asked to sign a blank cheque without really knowing the details. A, a poll of doctors last year showed that only one in seven GPs would be involved in the process and there was no post-event scrutiny. Their objections have been raised that there should be a right to die, I think we've all got it said that you can't be sure you won't be prosecuted. Well, I think it, that it, our system does allow scrutiny in a way that's probably greater than the jurisdictions that I've covered. The statement that doctors are doing it anyway, there really isn't strong evidence of that happening. And in fact, if there is any undercover euthanasia from SEAL's paper, it would seem to be much lower in the UK than it is in those jurisdictions that have changed the law. And doctors certainly can have open discussions and the hospital audit has shown that. And I don't think we can say that legislation is working overseas without problems because I do worry at that societal change, the normalisation. So I'm going to finish here, <coughs> but simply to point out that Parliament did throw out the Maris Bill, the Assisted Dying No. 2 Bill, by a vote of 330 to 118 the MPs went into it in a great deal of detail. They did have a conscience vote. They certainly were not subject to any pressures at all. And I was impressed at how they were seeking information from all sources. But I think that we need clear evidence that the law is dysfunctional or oppressive before we change it in this area. And that what would be put in its place would be better. Not just for some who want their death hastened, but for all, especially the most vulnerable in society, who would be very easily coerced into feeling that they're a burden, very easily pick up the message that what lies ahead is so bad that nobody dares speak about it, and that actually their best option, based on their own experience of seeing somebody die many years ago, because that memory is emblazoned on them, that therefore they are so terrified of that that they would opt to end their lives early. And I think it just reminds us that Sisley's legacy to say that the memory of the way people die lives on in people's memory is really important for us all to recall and to recall that whenever we have a patient in front of us to remember they matter because they are them. Thank you.